Okay, I think this is our home stretch here. Um, uh, and uh, to uh, kick off this final panel on the regulation of financial institutions, um, let me turn things over to Christina to uh, get things underway. All right, well, thanks, Lee. Final panel of the conference, I think, is both a privilege and a challenge. So thank you to our audience members that have stuck around, and hopefully we've got lots of people in TV land also, because we have a, a really what I think is a riveting topic that is right smack dab in the spotlight of the Supreme Court, the popular financial presses, legal academia, what have you, which is the you know, really the broader subject of agency independence. And in thinking about agency independence today, we're also going to spend some of our time zooming in to the specific question of the financial regulatory agencies and the question of whether the issues surrounding agency independence are different or the same for the financial regulatory institutions. And just to table set a little bit more for a moment, the reason we were interested in doing this panel is because the idea that agency power is executive power has long been a central tenant of the conservative legal movement. And yet, I think many have grown uncomfortable with things like a whole of government approach, which really operationalized this notion that agency power is executive power. And maybe it's because we find some of the examples of unitary theory or agency power as executive power in practice unsettling, right? So examples that come to mind, you know, thinking through what the longer term consequences uh, or potential costs and benefits of using the financial system to, you know, green the economy might be, using supervisory moral suasion, what have you, um, thinking about the implications of having the CFPB have quite a heavy hand in small business formation and thinking about whether the SEC is using its power to chill public capital formation, whether these are actually uh, agency power as executive power in action, and whether, whether we're ready to sort of accept uh, the consequences of that, of that theory. And so to talk about this issue and more, we have a really amazing panel and with huge gratitude and thanks to our, to our members for agreeing to speak. We have Todd Zwicky from George Mason um, Scalia School of Law. We also have Jeremy Kress from Michigan Ross. We have Jen Mascott also from GMU, Alan Werman from ASU Law, and finally Aaron Klein from the Brookings Institute. So each panelist is going to speak for no more than five minutes or so to give their perspective on this range of questions. And then I'll throw out a couple of questions to the panel. And then I hope every single one of you has a question because we're here until 6.30. All right, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Todd. All right, I'm gonna spend a few minutes um, setting this up for those who aren't enmeshed in the Byzantine world of financial regulation and all the different agencies and then <clears throat> give some reflections on it. So um, as, as Christina noted, one of the things that's very distinct about uh, financial regulatory agencies is their degree of independence, but that varies and their structures vary. A lot of these things are just grown up over time <clears throat> as sort of ad hoc type things. So we've got the Federal Reserve, which is a multi-member board that is not bipartisan, uh, where people are supposed to serve 14-year terms, but nobody ever does. Um, we've got the OCC, which is a single uh, member uh, basically executive, uh, but uh, type, uh, type agency. We've got the National Credit Union Administration, which is a five-member, multi-bipartisan uh, um, board. We've got the FDIC, which has the same basic structure. We've got the CFPB. They regulate different entities. FDIC regulates uh, both state and uh, federal banks in some ways. The Fed regulates bank holding companies. The OCC regulates banks. This whole thing is um, defies, I've never seen a, uh, um, an org chart of uh, federal regulators uh, that I've at least been able uh, to, uh, to understand. And then of course, we have the CFPB, and up until recently, we had the Office of Thrift Supervision, uh, which almost single-handedly brought down the global economy. Um, and 
finally there was an agency in Washington that failed enough uh, that you finally know what the limit is uh, for an agency finally being wiped out. It's the, uh, the OTS, uh, which was uh, put out of its, uh, its misery. Now, what's unusual about these financial regulatory agencies is they've got these different structures, as I described, but they also have a relatively unique uh, uh, thing, which most of them are self-funding. They're funding by assessments. Uh, which is they assess the parties that they regulate. The CFPB is unusual in that the CFPB draws its money directly from the Fed. Uh, the Fed they can drop to 12 percent of the revenues of the Fed just by basically sending over a note that says send us some money, right? Uh, um, and that, of course, was uh, argued in the uh, the Supreme Court earlier uh, this fall in CFPB versus uh, CFSA. We could talk uh, more about that under the appropriations. Um, clause. Um, and so that's the, the structure. Now, why do we have this? Uh, really, as far as I could tell, the rationale goes back to deposit insurance. The fundamental problem here is deposit insurance. We all know why we have deposit insurance. It came about uh, during the New Deal um, in order to deal with um, bank runs um, and liquidity problems. Now, the problem is, is like any form of insurance, once you get deposit insurance, what do you have? You have a moral hazard problem. Uh, and uh, so the solution is also the problem. Deposit insurance is a solution to the problem that small depositors who are creditors of a bank don't have the incentive or ability to monitor the banks. So you create deposit insurance, right? But then you have a moral hazard problem and this whole complex apparatus basically of supervision and all this sort of stuff arises out of the original sin in some sense of, uh, of deposit insurance. It kind of comes, comes along with it. And so what you have is, that's grown up on the back of this is sort of the apotheosis of the regulatory state, where you literally have hundreds of bank examiners ensconced in the offices of city, chase, and places like this, where they essentially show up at work every day at the bank. Uh, uh, and they work for the uh, work for the government uh, as they're supervising uh, these these mo these monstrosities, these gigantic uh, type things. So the logic is, well, we'll have assessments because that's the price you pay to get insurance. So now basically you have to pay to get yourself supervised because you're the one who gets the benefit of the uh, of, uh, the benefit of the, the the insurance. The other thing is is insulation from political pressure. So the idea here is is that banks are attempting. Uh, a source of off-balance sheet um, wealth transfers by politicians. And if you look around the world, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the freedom indexes like that Heritage has done and that sort of thing, one of the things they look at is the independence of the banking system because it's so easy for politicians to use the banking system as a vehicle for wealth redistribution. We still do that a lot here, obviously, uh, through the Community Reinvestment Act and things like this, right? But the idea is that we want to try to insulate people. Now, this idea of self-funding and, and independence, that's what brought down the OTS, which is the Office of Thrift Supervision, was overly dependent on a couple of thrifts that were the old SNLs. You may recall the SNL crisis, uh, which uh, back in the, uh, in the 80s, that was our last banking uh, scandal, our last banking uh, uh, collapse. Um, uh, and that became the Office of Thrift Supervision. Eventually, they became dependent on just a handful of thrifts who got big into mortgages, Wachovia and all those guys. And so uh, uh, their it seems that their dependence on them is what brought them down. Now, as for the political independence, um, I think one thing we could say about John McCain, I, I would say he was a national hero. He was also an unbelievably sanctimonious uh, politician, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons John McCain got so interested in campaign finance reform was he got tangled up in one of the uh, uh, SNL scandals. And his response was, if me, John McCain, the purest man in the world, can be corrupted uh, by uh, campaign finances, what hope do mere mortals have uh, for, uh, for this, right? So the SNL scandal basically brought all this, uh, all this to, uh, to light. Now, the idea here is, is that these institutions are just technical green eye shade sorts of guys reading balance sheets, doing all this sort of stuff. What we've actually seen is over time it has morphed into to something more, which is the independence, as Christina suggested, is not quite clear from the White House, right? There's a lot of these things now, like uh, the CFPB is in on the junk fee stuff. Uh, we've got the green stuff, right? All this stuff seems to be very coordinated with the White House for something supposedly uh, independent. Uh, the Fed's independence has waxed and waned over time, um, going back to funding the uh, Vietnam War, 
uh, for example, um, uh, doing that. We saw during the financial crisis, they went all in. Uh, Bernanke was all in with Paulson, basically strong arming banks and doing all the stuff that they did during the, uh, during the financial crisis. Um, uh, whether there is the Fed really independent, I think that would be an interesting thing for us to talk, uh, talk about. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but what we also see is because of the way in which this regulatory system works, we have, as I said, the apotheosis of the regulatory state. They use all this soft power. They use uh, regulatory dark matter, guidance, uh, and the like. And we see this, for example, in the um, NRA versus Vulo case, if you're looking at this right now, uh, where uh, they basically said a guidance, don't provide bank, it would be a reputation risk to provide a bank account to the NRA, uh, right? And they said, oh, we didn't tell them they couldn't provide a, uh, a bank account to the NRA. We just said it would look really bad uh, if they did that, right? They can also fiddle with the dials on fossil fuel ratings, for example, how you weight the risk of that. And that's a whole nother thing we could talk about and we could come back to um, uh, around it at the end. I'll close by saying uh, uh, just a few things, which is first, whatever this is, it's not the CFPB, right? The CFPB has tried to pretend like it's a financial regulatory agency when that's convenient, and it's not a financial regulatory agency when that's not convenient. It's clearly more like the FTC, I think, than these, uh, these, these other agencies. It is clearly affecting policy uh, out there in the, in the world. It is not just doing the kind of things like uh, um, deposit insurance and paying for that privilege. Instead, it's actually acting and making policy on, on third parties. I think that should be relevant to the question of appropriations. Uh, we'll see if the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, thinks that's the, uh, the case. The last thing I'll say that I think points up an interesting anomaly I think we'll come back to is the Fed. And one of the things I think is fascinating about the Fed and fascinating about a lot of these questions is this is one of those classic situations where the feature is the bug. Right? We understand why we'd want to have Fed independence on monetary policy so that politicians couldn't influence monetary policy for political purposes. Right? But think about it. The reason we don't want that is because the Fed's so powerful. <laughs> so the idea that somebody had said, I mean, Jerome Powell could just decide to put the entire economy into a recession, pretty much. That's a pretty weird power for a handful of people to, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to exercise, right, with very little oversight. Second thing I'll say is the way the Fed was originally structured, it was structured to have all these regional banks. Why? So that it wouldn't become an axis of control of New York and Washington. What does the Fed become? An axis of control of uh, New York and Washington, uh, as we saw during the financial crisis uh, uh, for example. So uh, with those table setting remarks, I'll, I'll t turn over the microphone. All right, thanks, Todd. Jeremy? Thanks, Christina, and thank you for, for having me. Um, as I kick off my remarks about uh, agency independence, I want to caveat uh, that I am very much not a constitutional law scholar. Um, what I am is a former bank regulator. Uh, I worked at the Fed uh, as an attorney in the wake of the, the 2008 crisis. Um, now, uh, an academic focusing on financial regulatory issues uh, in my role at University of Michigan. So I hope I can bring a little bit of a, a practitioner's view uh, to these issues. I want to make um, two main points uh, in my comments today. First is um, the political independence of the Fed's monetary function is a good thing uh, for all the reasons that Todd referenced. Uh, we think that political control of, uh, of the monetary function by the executive uh, would be bad uh, and, and ripe for all sorts of abuses uh, for reasons that should be fairly obvious and that we've seen demonstrated uh, abroad in some other jurisdictions um, that have less uh, political independence of their central bank. Um, so I am point number one, uh, strong vote in favor of uh, political independence of the Fed's monetary function. My second main point uh, that, that I'd like to dig a little deeper on is when it comes to the financial regulatory agencies, and particularly the bank regulatory agencies that Todd mentioned, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, it's all monetary. Right? Even when you look at the Fed's bank regulatory functions distinct from its monetary policy functions, uh, and when you look at what the FDIC does and what the OCC does, uh, there is a very close nexus to control of the money supply, uh, and therefore I think that necessitates the political independence uh, of the bank regulatory agencies. 
in coming to this view, I'm uh, very influenced by the scholarship of uh, Lev Menan from Columbia uh, and Morgan Ricks uh, from Vanderbilt, uh, who've written about the monetary origins of bank regulation, tracing it back to uh, the National Bank Act of 1864, uh, which, of course, was intended to centralize uh, federal control uh, over monetary issuance in the wake of uh, the collapse of the, the Second Bank of the United States. And in this context, uh, you know, the influence by Lev and Morgan's scholarship, I, I think it's clear that modern bank supervision and regulation is very closely linked to monetary policy. Uh, you can think of capital requirements, for example, which by definition affect how much money banks can issue by creating credit. Uh, same thing for reserve requirements and liquidity requirements. Um, this is my main point that when it comes to bank regulation, it's all monetary policy. So if you believe uh, that the president should not be able to directly control monetary policy uh, by setting interest rates or by engaging in quantitative easing because that would be ripe for all sorts of abuses, uh, then I think it follows that we should favor political independence for bank regulation uh, and supervision uh, because the president could accomplish the same objective uh, by, you know, could accomplish the same objective of, of expanding the money supply and, and juicing the economy uh, by cutting bank capital requirements as he could by lowering interest rates or engaging in quantitative easing. So I think uh, that's my broad case for why we should think about financial regulatory agencies and specifically bank regulatory agencies as unique in this regard uh, and why political independence of uh, the Fed both on the monetary policy and the regulatory side is a good thing and why that extends to, to the FDIC and OCC as well. Excellent. Well, I am um, a constitutional law and separation of powers scholar as opposed to a financial um, expert. So I'm going to drill, uh, drill down or uh, may, maybe scope out a little bit on some of the constitutional questions and whether there are any constitutional principles that should guide or kind of be in the backdrop of the conversation. But before I do, I think um, it's worth thinking about the definition of what it means to be independent. And we often, as we've already seen on this panel, see that as in contrast or the opposite of being politicized. And I think actually that may not be completely uh, correct. I think that um, agencies, whether they're the financial agencies or others, could be not entirely independent from some external authority law supervision, but also perhaps uh, at the same time not be politicized. So sometimes with political, we mean, you know, subject to the political whims of the president or to the electorate or whatever. And I think the constitutional concept of electoral accountability is not necessarily quite that. So the president, even if the president were to oversee every agency, including financial agencies in some level, um, I would submit in a constitutional construct that still wouldn't necessarily and, and wouldn't in any way authorize um, that control to be political in the sense that it could just go with the political interest, the individual interest of the president, um, because all of these powers are constrained by law and they're constrained by the constitutional oath to faithfully execute the law. And to the extent that we would want the president or even the financial regulators themselves to not be able to personally act in their own best interest or in a political fashion or with any kind of conflict of interest, you know, one answer could potentially be for Congress to give guidance legally um, about what all the standards are and what the powers are and what um, regulations or changes in interest rates are and are not authorized. So obviously the broader the law, the more discretion given to the financial regulator or the president. And so what do we mean when we say independent uh, uh, historically versus accountability? Um, from a constitutional standpoint, I think the theory would go, is there any constraining mechanism that the Constitution gives to the way Congress can statute some of these agencies, whether they're financial or not, through the executive, uh, the vesting of the executive power in the president? And obviously, as, as Todd and Jeremy both laid out, you know, those questions have sort of 
ebbed and flowed over time and are fairly complex and somewhat you know theoretical and perhaps often are oversimplified um, but generally speaking you know we've got executive agencies like the Treasury Department DOJ others where we're sort of comfortable with this cabinet secretary model the cabinet secretary is removable by the president then as Todd mentioned we've got these other agencies FTC SEC that have always had multi heads that represent both political parties subject to some tenure protection served for a term of years and then these other financial agencies that have sometimes components of both of those things and so I guess the question would be for the financial agencies particularly the uh, more discreet ones that Todd talked about is there a place in the constitutional structure for those to exist in a way where they're not exercising aspects of executive power and if they are do they have to be supervised at least in some level by a president who can make changes in leadership or give direction. And I guess to the extent that what they're doing is governmental, um, the purest constitutional answer would be yes, there's not any, th any type of power if it's governmental that they can be exercising other than some category of executive power. And so it might cause us just to question in general is what they're doing governmental? How closely do we want, how much involvement do we want the government to have period in um, controlling some of various things like um, money supply and rates? And when it does, how much can that be constrained and required to be done by certain metrics that don't lead to folks who really have no experience in the area, like presumably a president, to get involved in questions where they really have no ability to be able to, um, perhaps in a substantively positive way, guide guide what's happening. Um, but from a constitutional standpoint, um, you know, should these, is there a justification for these agencies to be given a different category? And if they are, to whom are they accountable? Is it fine for them to be accountable to Congress, to a committee? Um, how are the regulators themselves, um, who presumably would be also subject to the same potential conflicts of interest and questions and weaknesses as a politicized president or anybody else, how are they controlled and what is their source of accountability if it's not law or some other um, supervisor? So I think Elon's probably going to unpack a little bit more about where you think supervision comes but I would submit that the threshold starting point would be the executive power being vested in the president there is a reference I think that Elon talked about earlier today in the opinions clause about duties of principal officers but the Constitution uses duties and powers in a in a distinct fashion um, where it references duties and powers together. And so I think there are obligations often that are imposed on the president and, and, and principal officers and not necessarily as much power as we would sometimes think when we're worried about the politicized president. Good. Yep, thanks. Okay, great. So I'm in the somewhat, um, uh, at first I thought this was a real coup that I could just do the same paper on two different panels back to back. It's really killing two birds with one stone. Um, and now, though, I realize that two-thirds of you or so were in the previous panel, so I don't know exactly how I'm going to do this, so we'll, let's just see what happens. I'm going to try not to repeat more than three or, or four minutes of uh, what I said on the last panel. So what I'm, um, I have a paper called The Opinions Clause in Presidential Power uh, that I think uh, is, situates the presidency a bit differently than the two common prevailing conceptions. And I promise if you were here before, but then again, repetition isn't so bad, it helps retention, so I hope you're all still paying attention. Um, I'm not gonna go through quite all of it, but the two prevailing conceptions of presidential power are the formalist one, which says that all discretion granted by Congress to subordinate officers or agencies is the president's to exercise. So how would this cash out? The Fed cannot be independent. Congress could grant duties to the Fed, but the president can direct and control the Fed and can remove the Fed officials uh, if the president desires. The prevailing, I think, progressive uh, view uh, is, which tries to make sense of the opinions clause, but I won't get into that, is that the president does not have the power to remove or control officers as a matter of constitutional right. How would this cash out? Uh, it, it, when it comes to the Fed, Congress can give duties to the Fed and can insulate the Fed from presidential interference and removal. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay. What I think the actual answer is, what, in terms of which I try to present in this paper, which is not about the Fed, it's just about executive power generally, is that both of these conceptions are only half right. That I think the correct answer under the Constitution is the president has a power to remove. 
freely. Nobody can control this power. It can, of course, be abused, okay? But, but the president has the power to remove all principal officers at the president's will. But the president does not have a constitutional power or right to control and direct or interfere with the exercise of duties on the parts of principal officers, okay? Now, I will show some examples of this related to financial institutions, but the upshot, I think, is important. And so I just want to explain quickly the implication, okay? There is a huge difference in terms of political cost between the power to direct and control and the power to remove. Removing officers comes at a high political cost. Okay, so just ask George W. Bush and the U.S. attorneys, ask Richard Nixon um, when they came to the Saturday Night Massacre, ask Andrew Jackson, who tried to remove treasury deposits from the Bank of the United States, sacked two treasury secretaries who refused to do it, and then Tawny did it and would not get appointed a full, full appointment from the Senate, and there was other uh, political uh, blowback. So their political costs are different. Not only that, the political cost of removal goes up if we believe that the president does not have a constitutional right to interfere with those duties, right? Everyone can sort of see that. If the president, is what Andrew Jackson said, I have a right to tell the Treasury Secretary to do it, then there, there's nothing wrong with him firing a Treasury Secretary who refuses to do it. But Daniel Webster responded and said, you can fire the officer, no one doubts that, but it doesn't mean you haven't abused your power. The law grants the Treasury Secretary the duty and therefore the power to remove the deposits from the bank of the United States, he has to decide that, that, that it is appropriate to do so, and you fired these two other Treasury Secretaries in order to control that exercise of discretion. The political cost from removing increases if you think that that is, interference is impermissible. Okay, let me just give you a few examples of this, just like with the last panel, I won't go through appointments and removals, just trust me, that's part of the executive power, okay. So the question is, even if the president can remove, can he control? So here is re examples related to the Treasury, which is related to financial regulators. So when it came to settling legal claims, which was the duty of the comptroller of the Treasury and the auditor of the Treasury, Madison said, I question whether the president can or ought to have any interference in settling and adjusting legal claims against the United States. Thomas Jefferson, with the settlement of accounts at the Treasury, I have no right to interfere in the least. George Washington similarly said, um, my public situation forbids any interference in questions of individual claims. Um, this will be satisfactory to you for my declining to direct any investigation that you have asked. I have no power, nor would there be any propriety in my interfering with the settlement of accounts unless it be in the case of malpractice uh, of the officer. Okay, so here we have examples with pr many presidents, especially when it comes to claims against the government, these treasury uh, duties, saying, yeah, I can remove the officer if I think they're not exercising their duties well, but I have no right or power to interfere with those duties. Okay, um, and I mentioned the, another example is the, the Webster-Jackson fight over the bank deposits, another example where a duty was given to the Treasury Secretary and it was believed among the Whigs anyway that Jackson abused the removal power by trying to interfere with the Treasury deposits, uh, which was again a duty granted um, uh, to the Treasury Secretary. Okay, so how does this cash out generally? Now I wanna be clear again that this claim that I've made relates to all executive power. Okay, but it, it, therefore it also explains the, the, the situation of financial institutions, okay? I think under this account, there is no difference between financial agencies and other agencies. It's all executive power, but Congress can assign independent duties to all of them if Congress wants, subject to the president's oversight through the removal power. So the president could always remove. But just like Congress can grant independent duties um, to the Federal Trade Commission or I suppose to a certain extent um, the Attorney General, uh, the, the President can do so with financial institutions. Now, it turns out there is a norm and a practice of applying these principles differently to different kinds of agencies. So from the very first in 1789, there was a norm of giving the president full direction and control over the principal officers of the War and Foreign Affairs Department. And there's a statute in, that, the, in the statutes that were, that were subject to the removal power debate that specifically says that the principal officers of these departments shall follow and obey the instructions and directions um, of the president. Um, now, there, that, is, that is a norm that has continued throughout history, and it might be constitutionally required by other provisions of the Constitution, maybe the commander-in-chief power. I actually don't know. I actually don't know if that's true. But, but another, other constitutional powers might come into play. Now, the norm has been more mixed when it comes to prosecution, 
I think as an original matter, uh, the norm was actually of presidential control. Uh, over prosecution, but over time, the norm has become insulating U.S. attorneys and the attorney general um, from presidential interference. That is a norm um, uh, that uh, you know Congress ch chooses. Again, the president has no right in any, any respect without Congress here in terms of direction and control, but Congress has exercised this differently. Now, when it comes to financial agencies, it seems to me that the norm has been much more mixed, um, slightly more toward agency independence, whether it comes from the differences in the first treasury statute and the differences between that statute and the Foreign Affairs and War Department, um, giving many more specific duties, required reports to Congress, uh, when it comes to settling claims against the government, where it appeared that the controller and auditor were sort of given final say, the Bank of the United States is another example. Um, so the the so, so that's just a, a descriptive historical matter, how Congress's power to shape the president's directory and control, not affecting the removal power, okay, has cashed out differently to different types of agencies. So what's the bottom line here, and then I'll stop, is that Congress can assign, I think, independent duties to the Fed, right? Just like the Congress can assign independent duties to any agency, it is the Fed's discretion to exercise. So Jerome Powell, is he the, this is how much I know about this, Subject matter, by the way. Is Jerome Powell the Fed Chair? You got it. So, okay. Hasn't been removed or anything? Like, nope, okay. not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> so Jerome Powell gets to decide on interest rates. Jerome Powell gets to decide on monetary policy. Now, the president could bark orders. The president could tell him to do something, and Jerome Powell can say, okay, fire me. That's your only recourse. And oh, if you fire me, I'm going to go to Congress and the people and say, you are interfering with duties that Congress gave the Fed, and the political cost uh, will go high, be higher. But the president can always do that. The president can always nevertheless remove Jerome Powell if the president believes that Jerome Powell is not properly exercising uh, those duties. So I think this is a happy middle between you know, these two sort of extremes uh, where the president gets to interfere and there's total political control of the Fed on the one hand and independent, total independence on the other and agency expertise. It says, yeah, this is the agency gets to be independent, gets to exercise expertise, but there's always that removal power, that constitutional removal power that gives that political oversight. And, I, and uh, so I think that's how it works. I think it answers sort of Jeremy's point about direct control. I do have a thought, I think, on Jen's point about duties versus powers in the opinions clause, but I'll, when we get to the next round, maybe I'll say something about that. So it's a, he, he, can, right. I, um, he can remove him as chair, but not from so, the Federal Reserve. Is that right? So, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in, 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 a, in a sec, Todd. The, the danger with, uh, I'm Aaron Klein uh, at Brookings. Uh, I'm probably the uh, both the most dangerous and least competent person on this panel. Uh, I'm an economist, not a lawyer, uh, but I wrote law uh, during my time in the in the Senate or helped draft it. But you know, I, if you'd given me a bar exam and a prep, I feel very confident. After eight years of sitting in Ledge Council, I, I kind of got the hang of some of it. Uh, and I served in the Treasury Department. Uh, and in point of fact. Uh, one of the things when we had to do a blue sky exercise in 09, like the times in 09 were pretty bad. And there was a lot of like blue sky thinking, like if this thing got really bad, what, what can we legally do? And one of the things you could legally do with the DART money was put deposits in any bank of the secretary's choosing in the United States. That power has never been removed from the treasury secretary. In fact, the movement of money between banks was commonplace in the 19th century. And if you see a bank to this day in your small community town that says like Democrat or Republican, it was a signal that when the Democrats were in power, the, the federal government deposited money in that bank. And if the election went the wrong way, there was somebody coming with a withdrawal slip. And this made a big difference. And this, there are two points I want to get to it in, in my time and not respond as much to other folks because there's Everybody set me off here in different ways. <laughs> but it's to talk about first, what's different here is the power of the purse is Congress. The power to create money is clearly articulated, one is a federal power, right? We're done debating Maryland money versus Virginia money, right? There's United States money. I'm from Maryland. I don't trust Virginians and I don't trust their money. <laughs> However, we also had state chartered banks. We don't get national chartered banks until my favorite Republican president, Lincoln, comes onto the scene. And so you have state chartered banks, but they're chartered with federal money. And that's a core tension. I'm not gonna spend the rest of my time in the 19th century, but I wanna ask you guys, right? Today, 
what is this? I'm holding a $20 bill if, if the camera hasn't caught me. This is $20. This is a liability of the Federal Reserve created in 1913, right? Which predates deposit insurance and is, I think, the start of a lot of, of, of this situation. This is not a liability of the United States Treasury. The only liability the Treasury Department any of you have, besides your Treasury bonds that you might have as a broker-dealer, which frankly are the liability of the broker-dealers through your custodial account, um, is coins. Coins come from the mint. This comes. Now, this, which I'm holding my credit card because I didn't have a debit card without the numbers. I don't like holding up my numbers for, for a long time, right? This is bank money. All of the money that you have in the bank is not the liability of the Federal Reserve. It is the liability of that bank. Your bank money trades at par with my bank money, which trades at par with physical denominations. That's only because we have a deep amount of confidence in the banking system. We have deposit insurance, we have supervision, we have a bunch of things. Historically, that was not the case. Historically, your bank money and my bank money traded at discounts to each other based on the perceived health of that bank and that institution. This is important because the Federal Reserve and the role of Congress and the role of bank regulation, supervision, and insurance serves two distinct roles. One, it, it, it furthers the congressional thing of the money. What is money? What is federal money? What is universal money? What maximizes economic growth is not for us to debate what a JP Morgan Chase dollar is versus a Bank of America dollar versus a local bank first dollar, right? Do anybody want to know what a Silicon Valley bank dollar would have been worth about a weekend, a St. Patrick's Day weekend last year, right? It is, it is, it is not that. So consequently, Right? You have bank regulatory agencies carrying out an obligation to some degree of Congress. Congress wants to create this obligation to be independent of the president for a variety of political and economic reasons. It's not just fear of monetary policy uh, juicing the next election in favor of the president, although there is some of that. There's fear of treating different parts of the country, different parts of banks. Because remember, national banking comes in the 90s. Up until the 1990s, when all the agencies that we've been discussing, minus the Bureau, were created, there were no national banks. There were state banks. I mean, they were federally chartered, but they operated essentially within one state. And so you create a Byzantine system, which Todd did describe correctly as an alphabet soup, of different regulators covering different types of financial institutions, covering different functions of money created at different times in society, who have, are fulfilling at various points this congressional obligation. The second and last point I want to get to is this question of what is the Federal Reserve? So I, as I said, I don't know that much. I did learn when I was young that there were three branches of government. And I've worked in two of them. I've had a distinct honor. I think many of you in the room are going to end up in the third. So I'm going to read you a quote from the Federal Reserve System. And this is, quote occurs frequently uh, in Federal Reserve governor's speeches. It relates to the question of central bank digital currency. That is, should the Federal Reserve create a direct digital response? And it says this in following. The Fed has made no decision on issuing a central bank digital currency, and as Chair Powell has emphasized, would only proceed with clear support from the executive branch and authorizing legislation from Congress, end quote. That's the more modern reason. The legislation at one point was just consultation, but the Fed has changed it. Now, clear support from the executive branch and authorizing legislation from Congress to me indicates the speaker is neither from the executive branch nor from Congress. So what branch of government is the Federal Reserve Speaker speaking from? The Federal Reserve system is complicated. I picked this quote from a governor of the Federal Reserve who is an executive branch government. The 12 regional banks are not part of the United States government. They may pretend to be part of the government. They may act, roll out certain government-like responsibilities that have been assigned to them as a chartered corporation, as does your bank, which creates money but they're not part of the government. Elon ended with a point about the Fed could fire Jay Powell, and Todd added the point 
The Fed, well, but from what job? There are seven governors of the Federal Reserve. They are presidentially appointed. They are given 14-year terms, which is the longest term in the executive branch, if you believe they're in the executive branch, which it's hard for me to see otherwise. Right? The longest term is judicial lifetime, 15 years the Comptroller General. GAO is in the legislative branch. I got to work there once. The executive branch, longest term, 14 years, right? Uh, then there are 12 regional bank presidents appointed by private boards of regional banks. We just had an announcement of a new one today from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. A federal open market committee is made up of the 12 regional bank presidents, five of whom get to vote at any one time, and all the sitting governors, which can be up to seven. That entity elects a Federal Open Market Committee chair. So we say things in the popular vernacular is the chair of the Fed sets monetary policy. That is just not a factually accurate statement. Monetary policy is set by a committee of the Federal Open Markets. The Federal Open Markets Committee elects its own chair. By custom, it is the chair of the board and the vice chairman of that is the New York Fed. That is nowhere in statute. That is one of these customs. So if Jay Powell were fired from his four-year term as chairman of the board, but not his 14-year term as governor, the Federal Open Market Committee could re-elect him as chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. And whatever power you think being chair gives you relative to everyone else is a different question. As a legal matter, it is indisputable that that. Now, the Fe maybe the president could fire him both from being his separate term as chairman and his 14-year term as governor and kick him out of the whole thing. I, don't th I think the FOMC has to vote one of its members. It's not like the House, which can vote anyone speaker, right? But per Elon's point, the, the real constraint from when Trump threatened to do this was not Congress or lawyers, it was the market. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with finance, you have to con simultaneously consider the political consequences of this along with the economic consequences. And that makes this conversation, in my opinion, structurally different than other questions about other agencies, even those that are independent, like certain safety regulators, the National Transportation Safety Board, for example. So I'll leave my remarks there. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you to the panelists. I think we have a lot to, to talk about. And I've been, I think what's really interesting is despite the fact that you all picked up on different threads of agency independence, there is one thing that I think I heard everyone saying, which is that in order to assess agency independence, we need to think about what function the agency is exercising and not just think about whether independence attaches to the institution itself, which is how I think traditionally legal scholars think about it because they're looking for certain governance indicia to suggest that an agency is more or less independent on a relative scale. But what we're really saying is, okay, is the Fed independent in its monetary policy function? Is it independent in its supervisory and regulatory function? What is the CFPB doing? Does it really deserve independence or not. And I think what makes the Fed so interesting is that it's the only agency, even among the financial regulatory institutions, that is directly exercising an Article I power, which is the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. And I think that alone justifies its separation from the executive branch and goes most of the way to justifying central bank independence. And then the Fed's independence becomes more complicated because it, then it has these regulatory and supervisory functions um, that may or may not sort of, Jeremy was getting at this question, also contribute to that Article One, Section 8 power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. So I think everyone was pretty much saying something along those lines. So I'm curious to know your reactions to that, to my synopsis there. And then I'll also throw out another question to the panel. One thing we haven't addressed head on is the question of accountability, right? Because I think some of the qualms or questions we have around independence is whether you can, you know, I think there's probably consensus that you can't have independence without accountability. The question is, where does that accountability come from? Is it from congressional oversight? Is it from the president? It's from the people? Um, and whether what we're really trying to assess is what the right balance between independence and accountability is, um, question mark. I'll jump in on those. On the, on the first, I'll just say um, I disagree uh, with um, 
the idea that the Fed coins money because if it does, then it's unconstitutional. Uh, as a matter of original understanding, I've written this uh, for, the, for the Heritage Guide of the Constitution. I think it's a matter of original understanding. Coinage mean coin, means coinage. Uh, Aaron's $20 bill is, uh, cannot, is, cannot be legal tender. Um, uh, and um, they got away with that in the 19th century. Uh, you know, they originally said that greenbacks were unconstitutional, and then they reversed it the next year after a change in the, um, in, in the court. But I think um, as a matter of original understanding, um, uh, what the Fed does is unconstitutional uh, if they declare it to be legal tender. Uh, as for the accountability thing, this is something I have thought about is um, if you just think in terms of accountability, I think if Humphrey's executor is valid, it's valid because there's a certain degree of accountability that's different from political accountability. So the standard accountability we think about is executive branch accountability, the things that um, Jen and you know Alon spend their days uh, thinking about, Jen in particular, about being able to remove and this, that, and the other thing. The logic of uh, Humphrey's executor, to the extent there is a logic, uh, the logic for a bipartisan multi-member commission is that there's a different form of accountability there. Uh, the ability of minority commissioners to, um, to write dissents, uh, to, uh, to um, raise questions, uh, to basically create a deliberative process internally um, that uh, um, uh, creates some degree of accountability, create a record for, uh, for subsequent litigation uh, and the like. So I'm not saying necessarily that Humphrey's executor is correct, but to the extent it is, um, a multi-member bipartisan commission has some elements of accountability that, uh, um, that somebody else doesn't. So, for example, Christina has talked about the Fed doesn't have any of this, right? The Fed is basically uh, the Politburo when it comes to uh, decisions on, uh, on uh, monetary policy and other sorts of things. It's not bipartisan. Um, it's kind of closed, uh, clothed in secrecy uh, and the like. The CFPB, the idea of a single director independent agency, of course, is absurd under, uh, under this, this concept. Um, and so I do think there is an issue of accountability. It may come in more than one flavor, I think, as a matter of policy. Uh, whether it comes in more than one flavor is a matter of the Constitution. I will defer to my uh, to my colleagues here. <laughs> yeah, so I think the, the U.S. gets the accountability question uh, for the independent regulatory agencies about right. Um, Christina, I know you've got a, a piece on this, uh, in, in, um, not to, uh, maybe I should let you describe it, but I, th I think Christina's view is that we need more oversight mechanisms for the Federal Reserve. We need better accountability. I think uh, that the accountability mechanisms that are in place right now um, work reasonably well. In my view, they, they may work too well. Uh, and, and when I think about the accountability mechanisms for the Fed, I'm thinking primarily of uh, the four-year term for the chair uh, as opposed to the 14-year term for the, the full governor. So the chair has to go up uh, each uh, presidential term uh, for reappointment. Um, uh, in confirmation, um, and uh, then uh, mandatory congressional testimony. So the, the chair has to testify uh, twice a year. These are the semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins hearings, uh, and the vice chair for supervision has to testify uh, twice a year before um, the banking uh, committees of both the House and the Senate. Um, and having uh, been an attorney uh, at, at the Fed when uh, these hearings were happening, I think it's um, difficult to uh, describe just uh, what the the mindset is within the building in the couple weeks leading up to each of those hearings. Um, the, these hearings, I think, um, carry uh, perhaps too much weight uh, in, in setting uh, the Fed's course. Um, uh, it's funny when you think about it, they're really like five minute question and answer sessions with individual members of Congress. And yet uh, the amount of, of preparation and policy reorientation uh, that goes into preparing for those hearings, it's no coincidence that you will see uh, the Fed roll out a new policy uh, or a new program or propose a new regulation in the week before uh, those hearings because uh, the policymakers want uh, something to, to go and, and show uh, to Congress. Um, so it, it, it's always, it was always surprising to me how reactive uh, the principles were uh, 
um, because what's the enforcement mechanism? If uh, the, the Fed chair or the vice chair for supervision has to go up before uh, Congress and, and uh, tell a member of Congress something they, they don't want to hear, there, there's really no uh, enforcement mechanism. Maybe the member of Congress will write a, an angry letter, uh, but that's about as much as it, as far as it goes. And yet still, uh, we see, I think, a, a very high degree of responsiveness uh, from the Fed uh, to members of Congress. So um, maybe uh, um, as a legal matter, uh, Christina is right that the enforcement mechanisms uh, uh, are lacking, but I think as a practical matter, uh, they actually work pretty well if you're worried about um, uh, uh, responsiveness to, to Congress. Yeah, so, so I gr agree um, with large portions of what other folks have said, and just starting with, with Todd, completely agree that obviously the structure that was examined in Humphrey's executor has forms of accountability, and of course it'd be completely appropriate for Congress to impose a number of additional accountability mechanisms in various agencies. In fact, going back even to the uh, first statutes that Elon was talking about before in the Treasury Department, there was a lot more division of authority among many different principal and key officers than there were in the other agencies at the time, and a lot of internal checking mechanisms and conflict of interest mechanisms and um, folks not being able to hold certain assets that they were going to serve in positions. So I think those kinds of accountability mechanisms have resonated with Congress from the very beginning. The question would just be, is there a point in where there's a kind of accountability mechanism that somehow constrains presidential control in a way that's too overbearing. And so at least the Supreme Court recently has suggested that there might be certain limitations on the ability to remove significant officers that cross that line. And the court seems poised to perhaps consider whether there are, it should go even further in finding that you can't insulate folks too much from presidential control. But I think the question still goes back to what does presidential control mean? I'm not sure that um, Elon's distinction between removal and instructing totally solves the problem because I think most of us, if we were in an important position and were told by the president, if you don't do X, whatever X is, you will be fired. I'm not sure that that gets rid of the conflict of interest that would exist if the president came and, came and said you must do why and actually like force the hand. I think there'd still be a lot of pressure there that might politicize it depending on what the instruction is and what the threat is. And I guess I would just still submit that I don't think that the president, when we say he, even if we say he has control over all the government mental functions, whatever those are, within executive branch entities. He is constrained by law, he is constrained by the Constitution, and so I think it's certainly possible that Congress, whether it's through imposing significant requirements of expertise and credentialing to, to hem in who can be appointed to these positions or not, what they can do, what factors they have to look at in making decisions, those are all relevant ways in which the President, like anybody else, would be constrained by law. And I think that Todd and Aaron and others in many ways have hit on really important points that um, it's not entirely clear that all of the actions that we're talking about today being done in relation to the monetary policy actually involve governmental functions by governmental officials, which makes this a really big uh, distinction. And I think Todd also hits on a really important distinction, and Christina as well, on the function, that functions of making certain empirical decisions or controlling or releasing uh, monetary supply or, or, the, or the more adjudicative types of determinations that some of the agencies Todd discussed at the very beginning are doing doing are fundamentally different in kind from the big grand regulatory policy making and almost more legislating that's often being done by agencies. And I, I, I think there's an original matter, the character of what's being done there has significant impact on how closely the president needs to be able to supervise or, or not. I mean, the president can never direct under an originalist view of the Constitution anybody to act in a way that is counter to or outside the constraints of law. And so I think it's a lot more of a, um, needs to be a more sophisticated analysis about what we mean when we say the president can fire and he can direct. It always, again, has to be constrained by law. And we're only talking about over governmental functions that are indeed um, indeed executive, which may be a narrower category than we often, we often think. So I don't know that I have uh, too much to add, so I'll just say um, that to the extent the Fed has government functions at all, they have to be executive power, right? And I think this was Jen's point also, but it's printing money, 
uh, pursuant to an authorization from the Fed. That's executive power, supervising, regulating other banks, unless they voluntarily said, please, supervise us. We voluntarily do it. Um, it it's government power. And if it's government power, it's executive power. Um, uh, uh, and if it's executive power, it means the president must be able to appoint the officers uh, who do it with the advice and consent of the Senate and remove them. Whatever these regional banks have to say about it, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's unconstitutional to the extent that's what they're doing. Now, that's not to say they don't also have private functions that any other bank could do. Uh, it's not uncommon for the United States government, for the Congress, to create government-created entities that, in fact, don't exercise government power, like Amtrak, the Smithsonian, uh, the Bank of the United States, the original one. Right? It just depends on what their fu U.S. Olympic Committee, maybe? It depends on what their functions and duties um, are. And so to the extent that they're just doing anything any other bank could do, then, then yeah, I suppose um, Jerome Powell could be totally independent of the president because it's not government power. I don't know enough about this, but I suspect that much of what the Fed does is, is not just what other ordinary banks do and, and that it is government power. And in terms of accountability, the view under, under my account, it's obvious that it's, it's shared, right? That by Congress, by assigning the duties um, to uh, the Fed chair or the Fed or, or whatever, but the president still has the removal power, it creates a shared uh, accountability for the exercise um, of, this, of this power. Um, and look, and uh, on Jen's last point about whether this really makes a difference, you know, if you can fire, who cares, direct control. My whole thesis is sunk if you do not buy the argument that the political costs are different for removing versus directing and control, and it's sunk if you don't think that the political costs increase uh, depending on the right of the president to, to demand that of the, of the other officers. And I think I mentioned Richard Neustadt in the last panel. You know, one of the five elements of presidential control that he talked about as a practical matter uh, was whether the people he was commanding believed that the president had the right to ask that of them, right? Why did the steel workers continue to operate the steel plant after the federal government seized it? Did everyone ever like wonder about that? Well, they had an agreement with the government that if the government took it over, the workers wouldn't go on strike, and they believed that the president had the power to ask of that of them. Now, it turns out they were wrong, and the Supreme Court said uh, that, that that wasn't the case, but that matters. The fact that they believed that the government had the right to demand this of them made, made a difference. It made a difference, um, and I think, again, it make, made a difference to Jackson and Webster, it made a difference to Nixon, it made a difference to Bush, um, and made a difference, I think, um, in the case of Trump not firing Powell. So I'll, uh, I'm going to start by disagreeing with the person whom I think I'm closest to intellectual, uh, politically on the panel in, in Jeremy and say that the Fed is not that accountable when it chooses not to be. And I'm going to give you three examples from my own experience. The first was the application of something called the Collins Amendment uh, in Dodd-Frank as it related to a very obscure capital regulation on, on insurance companies that had been uh, caught up in Dodd-Frank. I'll never forget, I was testifying on this because I, I worked on the issue, uh, in, and I was testifying uh, um, on it, and the first witness I thought gave the killer testimony. She, she was disagreeing with the Fed's interpretation, and she said, I believe I understand the true intent of the Collins Amendment because I am Senator Collins. <laughs> And then, then the experts were called to after she spoke, and it was like, what are we, like, I, <laughs> um, you couldn't find a person outside of the Federal Reserve's general counsel who supported the Federal Reserve's reading of the law. That didn't matter. Right. Congress eventually changed the law, much to the surprise of the general counsel who thought he was going to jam a deep policy change that was totally different than the intention of Senator Collins. We can debate that. There was no account. There was a hearing. There was many. There was the senator herself testifying. And the Fed general counsel's like, that's that was example one. Um, example two, uh, Bear Stearns. We all remember when Bear Stearns got bailed out by the Fed, New York Fed, thirty billion dollars. Uh, uh, the chairman and ranking member asked to see what the U.S. taxpayer bought for thirty billion dollars. The Fed said, "We can't tell you. <laughs> Wouldn't tell you. Wouldn't tell." Eventually, after months of this, myself and one other staffer were allowed to go, to, a t to go up to New York, put all our electronic devices in a skiff, and look at a sheet of paper, and then leave with no notes, and report back to the chair and the ranking member on what it was. Now, eventually, 
right? Congress can change this. I put a provision, Section 129, in the Troubled Asset Relief uh, uh, Protection, uh, but TARP is known as ESA, is the formal name of the bill, that required a weekly reporting of everything they'd use the money for and all the bailouts and all the main lane. And so Congress can come back and change the law. So there's that level of accountability. But until the law, right, and they didn't like that section, trust me, they tried to get it out, but it was like they came to Congress and they needed TARP, and this was the Congress wanted this. But until that, they had, they, and they, it wasn't the Fed's asset, it was Maiden Lane LLC. There's all these shell games that are being played. Third example. In 1994, Congress passed a law called the Home Ownership and Protectivity Act, HOIPA, which said the Fed shall promulgate regulations on subprime mortgages. Alan Greenspan didn't like that. He didn't think subprime mortgages needed to be regulated. He relied on a lot of academic experts, probably including multiple papers of Todd's. And he refused <laughs> to promulgate subprime mortgage regulation. We had hearings, we had subprime mortgage hearings, Senator Sarbanes was chairman of the committee, did this, blah, blah, blah. Greenspan, not gonna do it. Now, eventually the Fed did promulgate subprime mortgage regulations in 2007. Little something happened between 1994 and 2007 in subprime mortgages. We can debate till the cows come home had the HUIPA law been passed or not, whether the financial crisis would have happened. That is not my point on this panel. My point on this panel is to say from 1994 to 2007, Congress, ref the Federal Reserve refused a shall promulgate regulations for 13 years and nothing happened to them. So I don't see how that means that we're in a state where you have an agency that's accountable. All right. Well, on that note, I think I will open it up to questions from the audience. Since we don't have a ton of time left, if there are no questions. We're happy to keep going. Okay, great. Just come up to the, if you can come up to the microphone and just identify yourself and ask your question, that would be wonderful. Certainly. Uh, Jeremy Kidd, Drake Law School. And um, like Aaron, I'm, I'm also an economist. Um, and so I was... My I, condolences. I, you know, Thank you very much. But I'm also a lawyer, so like double condolences or something. Our condolences. <laughs> right. So, so I, I've always believed, right, in the, in the need for independence of the Fed. But it, I can't, I'm not sure I, that may be the right answer. But in my head, I have running through my head Thomas Sowell's quote of there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Mm. And it seems like we've chosen, at least theoretically, the most extreme outcome. And there's very little discussion of the costs of that choice. And there have to be trade-offs. As, I mean, independence, and I'll put independence, I don't, independence of the Fed, it doesn't eliminate rent-seeking, it doesn't eliminate favor-seeking, and, you know, everyone's got their favorite conspiracy theory about why the Fed does X or Y, and maybe they are just the most pure, honest, well-intentioned people in the world and only do what is economically necessary, whatever that means. But in reality, it's almost certain that there's some rent-seeking going on, and all independence does is hide from the public exactly why the Fed has done what it has done. Whereas if the Fed, if the Fed chairman were answerable, you know, Illa's point, uh, um, if it were answerable to the president or anyone, then there would be someone who was actually accountable. Wow. And as we all know, I mean, monetary policy changes have real effects over time. And those do lead to presidents losing elections from time to time, even though theoretically they're not actually tied to Fed policies. And so what I guess I'm saying is right now we don't have any real accountability and no one really knows why the Fed does what it does if we chose some other policy that, le that actually <clears throat> let the president fire um, the Fed chairman or members of the Fed, you'd actually have a direct link, a direct accountability. And I, I don't think we'd really have to worry that much about the president intervening that much. Yes, they'd want to. But as we saw in the Trump administration, the president orders, often orders a lot of things. And right, me, right, uh, right thinking people say, I don't think we're going to do that today. Sometimes in opposition to the president's wishes and sometimes because they know better than the president what will actually be beneficial politically. So I guess what I'm saying is that there doesn't seem to be as high a cost to getting rid of Fed independence as sometimes we imagine. And it seems like there's a pretty high cost currently to having that independence. And I don't know where the right balance is, but I don't think we've adequately considered the trade-offs. I, I, I would agree with that in a couple different ways, which is first, um, to anybody who's ever read even a paragraph of Hayek, um, 
the Fed is the most absurd. The whole concept of the Fed is like completely absurd from an economic proposition, right? We have no idea what the what the price of a gallon of milk should be or pantyhose, yet somehow these guys know what the price of money should be for the entire economy uh, at any given time, right? It's kind of a preposterous idea to think uh, uh, what they're trying to do in terms of central planning, the, co the price of money in the, in the, the economy, uh, for example. Um, uh, but to Jeremy's point, I mean, I, I think that's right, right, which is it doesn't eliminate politics. It just allows the Fed to be political when it feels like it, right? So when the Fed feels like working with uh, Lyndon Johnson to finance the Vietnam War without having to raise taxes, the Fed does that, right? Uh, when the Fed decides it's going to get together with Hank Paulson and bail out all the big banks, um, it decides to do that, right, and acts totally uh, political during, uh, during that period. So in some sense, it's the independence from account uh, political accountability, as Jeremy said, doesn't eliminate politics. And as for the rent seeking, I remember back when COVID first hit, uh, and my wife was all nervous because remember the stock market collapsed. And she's like, do we have to take our money? Are we going to take our money out? And I said, no. And she's like, how can you be so calm? The stock market has collapsed. I mean, everybody knows the golden rule, right? Don't bet against the Fed. It's like one thing we know is the Fed takes care of rich people. The Fed takes care of people who are invested in the stock market. Uh, and so I said, the Fed will take care of us. And the Fed took care of us, right? And now, after they juiced everything up, then they got to ring out inflation, right? Which doesn't really impact us either. It impacts all the other schmoes, right? Uh, who lost their jobs, lost their savings, right? Uh, um, and, uh, um, and, you know, are now have to suffer under inflation, right? To say that's not political, to say that's not rent-seeking in some way, I think technically maybe it isn't, but it sure as heck uh, looks that way to, uh, to me. So it just seems like it just unleashes certain uh, um, preferences of, uh, of the, the, the Fed governors, uh, for example, and some of the other things uh, uh, that, that they do I think are very similar. All right, I'm going to abuse my moderator's privilege here to jump in. I mean, you asked about trade-offs, and I think that is the right question to be asking. I think it would be naive to say that the Fed doesn't act politically sometimes. But the dilemma is that our economy and our financial system has become so complicated that you have to ask exactly what you say about trade-offs. What would be the consequence if you didn't have the Fed acting as lender of last resort or market maker of last resort, and would those be net worse for everyone, for people that are invested in the financial system, but also in the real economy. And I think that is the real question to be asking. And the problem is once you think that it's net beneficial to have a central bank intervening in emergency situations, then I think you really want to have central bank independence because a strong executive that controls the central bank will, I think, inevitably lead you to central planning. And so that's a big part of why we have central bank independence also. Um, so I'm not really supposed to be giving my opinion, but you did ask about trade-offs. So let's move on to the next question. We'll go here and then we'll go to Lee. Would it be a good idea to have a constitutional amendment authorizing Congress to create a, an independent central bank saying something about what it would look like, how independent it should be, what its mission should be, like price stability or something like that? Put, a, put, put, put the constitutional questions away and put some constraints on what the central bank looks like? It, it, in what world do you think that you could muster the political support required to amend the Constitution to address that type of complicated? That wasn't his question. It, but, in a room yeah. full of academics. In a room full of academics. <laughs> oh, there's Wait, no can, prayer. Can I, can I just make an observation here? I'm not going to uh, include my opinion. What is interesting is that central banks that were created after the consensus formed around central bank independence, so 90s and onward, are sort of constitutionally provided for. So the classic example of that is the European Central Bank, which is established in treaty. And their independence is specified in the treaty structure. And they're given one mandate to try and guard against political interference. So it's an interesting counterfactual. So, can, can I double on the, the ECB? Because I did an exchange program at the European Parliament when I was in, in the US Senate. And one thing that's fascinating is, is the, indep the independence argument is core to monetary policy. It is often extended to bank regulation, payments, research, statistics, a bunch of, uh, you know, I mean, the Fed is the largest employer of PhD economists in America, 
They run a university publishing academically independent papers with quasi-tenure-like status. Mm -hmm. the, um, the European Parliament votes on bank regulation. For those of us in the bank regulatory world, there's a thing called Basel III, which is a bank capital rules that are going through. And it, you may have even seen that it's risen to the political, the political fight has risen to the point where there are ads on Sunday night football. Mm -hmm. In Europe, whatever the central bank would propose would be open, would be text of an amendment before the European Parliament subject to debate and edit. And that would be a radical change to the United States for all bank regulatory, not just the Fed, because it, Basel in the U.S. has to be implemented by all the bank regulators. So the Europeans have a yes on monetary policy in their central bank, but they have a very different structure on regulatory policy as it relates to their independence from the legislature. There are other central banks, like the Central Bank of Colombia, ones that were like ad advised by the IMF in later periods that are part of their constitutional framework because it is so hard to conceptualize where central banks fit within a separation of powers framework. So I, I know where your question is coming from, and it's a really good one. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, Aaron brought up Basel III, and I think that's, I think Basel III is a, uh, example of, of my thesis of the, the Fed's accountability because uh, we've seen do literally dozens of congressional letters uh, to the banking agencies uh, about Basel III. And I think we are likely to see some significant changes to the pro between the proposal and the final rule in large part in response to that congressional feedback. So I think perhaps we are in a different era of Fed accountability today. I think a lot, of, large part of Jay Powell's perceived success at the Fed is because of his responsiveness to Congress. Um, uh, so I think uh, we're, we're no longer in the Greenspan era with Hopa. Uh, I, I think is what I'm saying. And um, you know, you, you may be right it, as as Christina's point about the uh, the descriptive legal accountability mechanisms. But I think uh, as a, a, a practical matter uh, today, uh, we are uh, at a, a peak of Fed responsiveness to, to Congress. I would say if we're going to have a central bank, I would endorse what you're saying, John. It's just, it's just some structure around instead of what we have is this thing that just grew up kind of out of nowhere without any clear authorization. It's clear that it was, and nothing like this was contemplated as part of the original constitutional structure, the coinage clause. Um, the gold standard of the 19th century, uh, the uh, the free banking structure of the 19th century, right? And you know, it really takes something like the Fed to create the kind of catastrophes uh, that we've had during the 20th and 21st century, right? During the 19th century, nobody would have the ability to come up with the idea of the Great Depression, right? Uh, which was all caused uh, by the Fed, right? And Fed monetary policy, or the inflation of the 70s, uh, or the financial crisis uh, following uh, the uh, um, interest rate policies of the early 2000s, right? All these sorts of things. The Fed is a hugely destabilizing influence ever since it's ever come along compared to the relatively small recessions and panics that we had during the, the 19th century under the gold standard uh, and the, uh, the upward uh, structure there. So if we're gonna have it, I think something that actually authorizes it, constrains it. Um, personally, I would say, does something involving some sort of monetary rule, even if it's just, what is your monetary rule? Uh, is Jeb Hensertling uh, wanted? Because I think what we have now, this just sort of pell-mell system where they just wake up and decide they're gonna do something based on whatever, um, seems absurd to me, so. Lee? Yeah. I I wonder if the market hasn't really found its way around the Fed's efforts to regulate the, mon the money supply. And, you know, this may be a naive um, reaction, but, I mean, with all of these, you know, with credit being available in the way that it is privately, um, I, I really wonder how much the Fed actually matters these days um, uh, in terms of the money supply. And global capital flows also. Right. Right. I, I couldn't agree more with Todd. If you think the Fed didn't matter, you would have had a very different experience after COVID. And the Fed bailed out junk bond holders. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that was... Under the name of COVID relief. <laughs> that was what? I mean, the price of junk bonds correlates through to the price of other assets in your 401k. Yeah. 
if you think the Fed didn't matter and that the private market would have stepped up and bought all these assets in mid-March 2020, I mean, it's all a confidence game. And you can point to the kind of counterfactual of given that there's a, a somebody at the table with infinite confidence. But I, I, on that one, I'm where Todd is. The, the market, the, the, the value of assets would have flown wildly and had a huge set of knock-on consequences had the Fed not bailed out a bunch of folks in 2008 or in 2020. Well, Jeremy, this goes to your point. Exactly. I, I, I hear where you're coming from, Lee, and I think I began my comments by invoking scholarship from Levin and and Morgan Ricks, and uh, they traced the root of all evils of the modern monetary system to uh, the private issuance of money outside of the banking system through short-term deposit-like substitute debt, uh, which does take the monetary function out of the control of the Fed and the other bank regulators. Uh, so they would say, in fact, Morgan was on a panel earlier across the street uh, advocating for um, the elimination of private deposit substitutes. Um, and, and I think, uh, if, you know, as a monetary purist, that that would be the, the view. So uh, you can have um, differing views about the, the shadow banking system as a practical matter. The shadow banking system is largely unregulated now. Uh, I, I think we should have better regulation of it. And uh, if we did, I think that would support the political independence of, of that function as well. Shark, go ahead. Uh, Moin, yeah, yeah, University of Alberta. Uh, well, to, to Lee's point, uh, I mean, the growth of substitutes such as cryptocurrencies not necessarily in the United States, but in other parts of the world where their banking systems are in utter collapse, you see crypto essentially becoming the substitute to central banking. And even in those countries where the central bank has tried to outlaw uh, crypto, you just see crypto going underground and just basically grinding in the back. And well, ultimately, some of those countries have said, OK, fine, we give up. Let, let crypto come back out in the open. But uh, to Todd's point, it's not just uh, the unconstitutionality uh, of the of issuing currency, even if you agree, even if you say find the legal tender uh, cases as well as the gold clause cases, no. but all, but both those cases we're talking about the treasury secretary of the treasury issuing the currency, not about this independent agency. Right. So it's doubly unconstitutional. It's not only that you know this agency has no authority to coin; it should be Congress. But if you even buy into those uh, clauses, it should have been the Secretary of Treasury, which gets us back to the presidential control, as opposed to this weird creature that's just unaccountable and un, um, you know, has no even constitutional authorization. Do you want to respond to the crypto point, Aaron? Or, I, mean yeah, I mean, anybody here buy anything in crypto? Crypto is an asset. It's not a payment mechanism. Ripple. Huh? Ripple. Ripple is just a way to move money between banks, which is what SWIFT does, which is a payment network. And I mean, it's, it's, it's true, right? Uh, uh, you know, the interbank market has some inefficiencies that better technology could handle, but crypto is not a payment substitute. It is an asset class. We can debate the valuation of that asset class that's debated in the market all the time. Right, but it is not a matter. Now you can come back and say, well, it would be a payment system if we gave it the same tax treatment that you give cash, and and there's there's a, a reasonable argument there. But as a matter, I think somebody the other day pointed out that it's been 30 years since uh, we had a net browser invented, right? Mozilla Firefox. It's been 15 years since Bitcoin was invented. Think about where how much you used an internet browser or email 15 years after its invention, and how much you use Bit any crypto. 15 years later. I do think your question about crypto or your statement about crypto um, provides us with an opportunity to tie this back to this bigger question about what kind of power is the power to issue money, right? So if you think it's a governmental power, you may well think it's a sovereign power, and then you may well think it's an exclusive sovereign power, right? And so if you believe that, then you think that the state should have the ability to quash crypto and any kind of, or control any kind of private money creation. But if you don't think that, if you don't think that monetary creation is a exclusive governmental or sovereign power, then you would be more likely to accept 
privately created money in any form, whether that's deposit substitutes or um, privately issued stable coins. So I do think this is part of the bigger debate about what kind of power is the Fed exercising when it creates Federal Reserve notes and central bank reserves. And calls them legal tender. One last question goes to our fearless leader. This this may may be naive, but doesn't something like crypto or or things like that, don't they generally come about because of, at least in some people's mind, a perceived need? And if that if that need is real, aren't they going to be likely to find some way to become more entrenched? In other words, you know, the, 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 if, if, if there's an insecurity about certain ways in which the economic system is so, working. So, so, I mean, like, look, it's really weird when you ascribe value to things, right? Gold has value, yeah. right? The value of gold is far in excess of its actual metallic, right? It's, it's a value because it's been assigned value, right? If you look at Friedman and, and Fay, right, the, one of the big mistakes we make, I think, is we use the John Locke definition of money, right, which is a, mean, a mechanism of payment, and not the um, kind of more Friedman argument, which is a system of debits and credits with third party acceptance without prior party consent. And th- in that situation, you get into the question about whether or not the means that we have for existing movement of, of money, right, are problematic. The real thing about Bitcoin is you can create value out of nothing, right? Bitcoin was cost nothing and you can create something and now that value goes out there. Frequent flyer miles. What's the difference between frequent flyer miles and Bitcoin as it relates to money? The answer is frequent flyer aren't money because you can't transfer them without the issuer's consent. Right, we have lots of points and lots of other things going out there around there. So uh, I think part of the problem with crypto is that you're dealing with a fundamental va- right value proposition and a need. People have a need to take money out of countries that have capital constraints. Chinese pe- people want to get you know hard currency out of various places. There's plenty. There's a need to avoid sanctions. There's a need for ransomware. Right? There's a need for lots of, of activity. It may not be activity we want, but that will do that. Uh, uh, I think the kind of longer term core question, which is can you create a thing that has third party uh, uh, consent without prior party access of a system of debits and credits and accounting without the backing of the state is a valid question and I guess I would pause by asking you, why don't we all transact in Amazon points? Right? There's, a, there's an example of a stateless entity, right? So think not just in terms of crypto in the forms that you've seen it. Think about digital stores of value from other issuers and other mechanisms. I, you know, I'll, I'll say the, the idea of private money creation is perfectly conventional. It's a perfectly good idea. Swift versus Tyson was a case about private money creation, right? Swift versus Tyson was a question about using bills of exchange uh, uh, as a transactional medium. Uh, In 19th century America, when specie was rare uh, and we had coins, we had all kind of private currency. The whole idea of bills of exchange and commercial paper arose as a way to be able to create commerce using basically private issued money, private pieces of paper that circulated in lieu of having to carry around coins uh, that could be stolen. Um, If you want to know more, I just posted an article two days ago on SSRN on why Erie is even worse than you ever thought it was, uh, and SWIFT is even uh, more correct than uh, anybody ever thought it was. But the point is, we've had bills of exchange, we've had commercial paper, we've had private issued banknotes, we have all these sorts of things that I think work great. They work much better than uh, than the disaster that the Fed generally has been uh, over, the, uh, over, over its existence. What I'll say about crypto is crypto still looks to me like a su- solution in search of a problem. Um, bills of exchange solved a real problem. They solved the problem, the portability of money, general negotiability of money, um, insulation from, from being hijacked on the road uh, and having your, your coins stolen, right? Those sorts of, uh, sorts of things. Credit cards, checks, all these things, 
serve a function. I've yet to figure out what good, at least what good uh, uh, purpose crypto solves that's not solved by the current financial system. I could think of a lot of bad things uh, that, it, uh, that it solves. And I could think of a future where it will be really important uh, if the government, for example, really does try to go with something like uh, central bank digital currency or really ramps up their debanking efforts and the kind of monitoring and you know, uh, financial surveillance that the government is, uh, uh, is doing uh, for political purposes and other sorts of things. Um, then crypto can emerge, uh, um, I think, to try to preserve privacy uh, in that world. But right now, I tend to think like Aaron, I can't kind of, it doesn't really serve a money function right now. What so about it's totalitarian countries? Like. What's that? What about totalitarian countries? Oh, and to yeah, totalitarian countries, uh, yeah, we, we, it serves a function there of trying to, you know, insulate yourself from, uh, from sur surveillance, right? Um, that's why I say, well, if we get central bank digital currency in this country, I think crypto becomes really important uh, uh, as a way of preserving privacy uh, from, uh, from control of, uh, of, of the government. I mean, they're already debanking people uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the like. So, um, so if they had that power, I'd get very anxious as to what uh, would be. But right now, I don't see uh, that crypto is a useful successor to the bill of exchange uh, and uh, prior forms of private issued money. With that, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists. It's like the end of it. <laughs>